today, a new series today in the story. We were just in uh, the Judges era, talking about the, the cycle of Judges and then the Samson cycle, and we've been, we've been kind of working our way through the story. And so right now, we're going to be starting a new one, and we're going to be in the Kingdom era. Okay, so the kingdom comes right after the judges. The judges were there to kind of lead Israel at, during these pockets of time. And then like on that video, which is a great overview of the entire thing, um, what they do is they say, well, now we want a king. It's kind of like they're, they're a little fatigued of the cycle that's been going on, of all the judges that are rising up and then falling away, and then oppression happens. And so they're like, well, this, this isn't working. They're getting impatient. They want a king. They see everybody else has a king. We want to be like everybody else. So they're talking to Samuel, and he says, you, you don't really want a king. I said, yeah, we do. We do want that. So this ushers in the kingdom era. And in the kingdom era, it starts out with three kings in a unified kingdom. We have Saul, David, and Solomon. And in this series, we're going to look at those guys, because then after Solomon, what happens is the kingdom divides. And then you got this northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and it just goes from bad to worse in the kingdom era. Okay, and then the story continues, and God still, has, God still has a plan, God is still redeeming, and has a plan to save his people, but this is where the kingdom starts, and we're going to start with Saul. So what we're focusing on, we're still focusing on transformed lives, uh, and that's looking at the people of the Bible, looking at the characters in the story, kind of seeing uh, how these are actually human beings, and not just like mythical heroes or folk tales, uh, but we can look at these guys and really see ourselves in them in a lot of ways. Uh, so that's what we're focused on. That's what we're focused on the people of this here. So our series is going to be all about hearts. And we're going to be talking about Saul today. Not, not Saul that became Paul, but King Saul uh, in 1 Samuel. And that's where we're going to be. So what I want to do today is I want to tell you the story about this king who thought that he had a heart for God. And we're going to see where we can go from there. So Bo... Why don't you come on up? We're going to be in 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 15. Bo's going to read that for us. 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 15. Yep. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. He called me. So Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went. Three. Three. You get it? Okay. 13, 13, sorry. I gave you the wrong page. Man, I'm a moron. 13, 5 through 15, not 3. <laughs> the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots and 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the sea. They went up to the camp at Mikdash, east of Beth. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army had threat, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgad, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilead. And Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattered, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembled at Midnight, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. And I had not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all the time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out again after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Samuel left the again and went up to Gideon in Benjamin, and Saul counted the men who were there with him. They numbered about 600. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> so I want to set the tone of what's happening here. If you look in uh, back in verse 5 uh, through 7, the Philistine army is described, and it's 
it's a pretty uh, amazing force that they have. Uh, it's not just a bunch of a bunch of swordsmen that are standing in rows, but what it is is it says they had three thousand chariots, six thousand charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. So think about like a chariot back in the day was kind of like a tank today, right? So imagine you know coming to battle and you come over this hill and then there's you know three thousand tanks staring you down and um, several. Uh, regiments and battalions of soldiers staring you down, and you're you're just you're Israel. And at, up to this point, what had been happening? Remember, they had been oppressed by enemies several times over, and so all of their weapons uh, became, you know, farming equipment. So these guys, they're not going out with spears and shields and swords; they're going out with sickles and rakes, you know, and sticks. I mean, they they're they're going with basically nothing. It's like if you. If, if an intruder comes to your house and the first thing you can grab is like a, a coffee mug, that's your weapon, you know? So they don't have much to their name, they don't have much to their force, they don't have much confidence really in their abilities, and they're coming up against this army that's just gleaming in the sun with all their spear points and chariots, and horses are going nuts, and people are yelling and hollering, and it is, it is a terrifying thing. Like, this scene is not one where it's just like, we got this. Like, they're showing up in a situation where they are instantly overwhelmed. Numerically, uh, they're overwhelmed in power, they're overwhelmed uh, strategically. I mean, there's all this stuff that is just kind of taken them, um, and they have these limited resources, and so there's this fear, right? If you look at their response, it says, uh, they went up in the camp, and when, they, when the Israelites saw that their situation was critical, and that the army was hard-pressed, what they do? They start running. A lot of them are like going into caves to hide, they're hiding in thickets, like they're just hiding behind bushes. Some of them are running, like when it says that they crossed the Jordan into the land of Gad, that means that they're like, they are retreating across a river into a completely different region. They don't even want to be near this. Like, this is what's happening to the hearts of the people right now. So they are terrified at what is happening. So my question for you guys is, as we set the tone of this, I mean, have you ever felt overwhelmed? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a dumb question, right? Some of us are just pressed by stuff right now, just... The, the, the pace of life or the circumstances that are going on that you just have no answers for. We, just, we are a people that get overwhelmed so easily. I mean, how many times in your life have you walked over the top of that hill and then suddenly you're surrounded, you see that your situation is critical, you are pressed on every side, you don't know what to do. So you just kind of bolt. Or you think about it. Or at least hide for a while, seeing it. I mean, that's what happens, y'all. I feel overwhelmed right now, like today, because of all the stuff that's happened with Morgan. My nerves are shot, I am exhausted, and I feel just broken <laughs> for that family. And so, in this story, if this was me, if, if I crested that hill and saw that before me, man, without God, without a heart for the Lord, I would be running across the river, I would be hiding in caves, I would be disappearing and abandoning my people. And thank God that he's stronger than that, right? But just put yourself in this. If, if you felt overwhelmed before, we understand and we can relate to how Saul is going to react in this story given the situation. So, but, but there's something that happens next and it's kind of a big deal, but it doesn't, kind of, it doesn't really seem like it at first. So I want to unpack that for you, okay? So the big deal here, if you look in verses uh, 8 through 13 is where we're going to be now. So go ahead and just kind of put your finger there. But uh, talk to me here for a second. What happens if you uh, turn in a project on time but unfinished? What happens? What's the result? Huh? You, yeah, you, but you turned it in. You were obedient to that. But it's unfinished. So you kind of get... Got to get slapped around a little bit in the grade department. You know, unless your teacher has a paddle under that. I don't know. Uh, bring it back. Uh, <laughs> how about this? What, uh, what would your mom say if you took the trash to the door but not to the curb? <laughs> what would she say? How many of you guys even have that chore? You're the trash person at home. Yeah? Yeah, me too. I mean, it's awesome. It's a great job to have. But what would your mom say if you took the trash to the door but not to the curb on trash day? Oh, she wouldn't do that. Come on. You guys don't make trash talk. What would they say? Did 
<laughs> you guys are terrified to speak. This is amazing. What would your mom say? Finish the job. Finish the job. Would she call you anything? Or just kind of like give you that look with the eyebrow? Yeah. Lazy. lazy? Finish the job, lazy. I would too. I use sarcasm as a motivator. <laughs> Uh, how about this? What would your dad do if you left a few lines unmowed? <laughs> yeah, who said that? I didn't see your face. Get out there and finish it. Yeah. I mean, that would that would drive me crazy if I look out and I see like there's like a strip of like 20 feet of grass. And it's just like, <laughs> how did you how did you possibly miss that? But I did that too. But I was learning how to mow. It was kind of like one of these motions. You know, I never went in a straight line, drove my dad crazy because I would leave triangles like at the end of the river, right? And he's like, you're not done. Get out there and finish the job. You know? Um, what happens if you go to get your learner permit, but you don't bring a parent or a legal guardian with you? Well, you can start <laughs> yeah, you, you're, you're kind of stuck, and you've got nowhere. You can't get it, right? That's like the requirement to have. You, if you don't have your parent there, you don't get your permit to start driving because they're the responsible ones up to this point. Right? So, I mean, there's a lot of things when you think about um, all of these, and there's a, there's a number of ways that you can illustrate this and think through this idea. Um, but, but what I want you to understand from this, is, and that's why I'm throwing this picture up here, is that partial obedience is really only disobedience made look acceptable. So what happens with Saul in this story is, he says that he waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. All right? So remember, they're already freaked out. Saul kind of has that fear in him already. If you look back at his story, when they're looking to anoint him as king, he's hiding. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want that recognition. He doesn't want the role. So he's hiding his fear in him already. So when he sees this, he says, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered them up. And just as he finished making that, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him as if nothing was wrong. Samuel said, what have you done? Saul replied, when I saw the men were scattering, and that you didn't come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling, I thought, well, now they'll come down against me, and I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. And Samuel said, you've done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. So Saul's issue here is that it was partial obedience. He waited the time that Samuel told him to wait, but then he got impatient. He took it over. He did it himself. It wasn't complete obedience. He did something he wasn't even supposed to be doing, according to God. All right, so that partial obedience eventually led to his downfall. And that's what we do, y'all. We, we have partial obedience all the time, and then we try to justify the tail end of it and say, no, but I did. I, I did what I was supposed to do. I turned it in. You didn't finish it, but I turned it in on time. Or I, I did mow today, Dad, but you didn't finish. You left some grass strips. You gotta go finish. But I mowed. I don't have time anymore. You know, we start to justify on the tail end for our shortcomings because partial obedience to us is good enough. And it was to Saul too. See what this text is about is about learning to trust God when you see your own resources slipping away. But it's also about learning to trust God even when you think your resources are sufficient, when you think you can handle it alone. And that is perhaps when we need to look to him more completely. Another quote about this says, Offering a sacrifice to enlist a deity's favor before an impending battle was common in the ancient Near East. This favor would hopefully ensure the gods' willingness to participate in the conflict. The Iliad even provides many examples of this in contemporary Greek literature. The use of sacrifices and omens to determine the will of the gods before going to battle is an essential part of military strategy. In Saul's case, the need for the ritual was interfering with the strategic element of timing. He's a military commander. He sees his army slipping away. They have a window of opportunity. He wants to strike. But there's this sacrifice that Samuel needs to do first. And he's just kind of standing like, oh my gosh, when are you going to get here? Like, we've got to grow. And so that impatience takes over, and he handles it himself. His choice attempted to acquire the ritual benefit by offering the sacrifice himself and still try to take advantage of striking before the strategic military moment had passed. So, we've seen that Saul's army is fleeing. They're scared. He's kind of scared too. They're all they're all taken off, um, and then 
what he said in verse 8 was that he did wait, but here's the thing, another, another quote from this, it says, Indeed, in many respects, this is the anatomy of sin. First comes the tyranny of the urgent, the encroaching pressure from surrounding circumstances. How many of you guys are living in that right now? With testing and finals and prom and graduation and scholarship applications and future plans and summer plans. And we, are, we are responding to the tyranny of the urgent because all this pressure is starting to just close in on us as the year starts to close itself out. And that's where it begins. And then this is followed by the insecurity and self-doubt arising from a lack of total reliance on God. When we feel pressure, we start to say, you know what, God, I got this. I'm going to take this and handle this myself. I'm going to do what I think is best because I know exactly where I'm at and what I feel. And you, you are just some distant thing that I'm not sure is even listening to me. That is how we start to feel when the pressure is on and when that heat is turned up. You know, you're sitting in a hospital waiting room. It's like, I just want to do something. All I'm doing is sitting here. Or when you're sitting at, at school and like testing is coming and you're just like, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna just do, I'm gonna spend all night studying this, I'm gonna just take time out of church, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just push pause in my community for a little while because I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna finish this. Gosh, that's an exhausting attitude. It's an exhausting disposition to have when we don't fully rely on God. There follows the rebellion itself after that, the pitiful human attempt to take matters into our own hands, which is tantamount to usurping or at least presuming upon the authority of God. This is the picture of sin demonstrated in the Garden of Eden as the paradigm of human failure. And as we all know too well, at least in our most honest moments, it's a pattern repeated many times in our own lives. This is the pattern that we get in. This is the pattern that I struggle with right now. Because I'm a fixer, I'm a doer, I'm action-oriented, I want to step in and then save. You know? I want to see a problem and go, I know how to fix that, and then I want to do something about that. It hurts me, it, like at a soul level, to just have to sit and go, all right, God, I know what your word says, and I have to trust that. I have to trust that you're going to act on my behalf here. Because I really, really want to just ignore you and take over myself. And I think there's a lot of us that kind of lean that way in certain situations. That's what Saul did here. Saul's guilt was because of impatience and self-reliance. So our struggle to live a transformed life is no different. But the God who transforms is different. And that is what the good news for us is today. Because when we want to grab and hold on and take control and own and, and do all of this stuff on our own power, with our own creativity, with just the depths of our own brilliance, when we want to do that, we can trust that the God who wants us to be transformed is the one who will transform. We can trust that the God who created our intellect and our creativity and our strength and our motivation and our resolve and our resiliency, the one who created all that, can also say, hey, just be still and let me fight for you. The God who transforms is different. And that's our good news. Check this out. 1 Samuel 13, 14. Look at that. Let's read that. 1 Samuel 13, 14. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. This is the big clue for us to see what the issue here is. The issue for Saul wasn't an action. The issue for Saul was the condition of his heart. Do you see that? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. Um, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. This is, where we, this is where we land. This is where we're looking. This is what the series is all about, is the condition of the heart. Okay? So Saul, if, if you look at the kings, I mean, that's, just, that's what that series graphic is all about. Saul had no heart for God. David had a whole heart. Solomon had a half heart. That's what the graphics all represent. So we're starting here with this guy who thought he was being obedient. He thought he had a heart for God. He had no heart. That's what, that's what Samuel says here. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. This is the significance and the thing about Saul was that he, didn't, he had no heart for God because he felt like he didn't need it. 
If you go back just a couple chapters and look at Saul, he's, he's taller than everybody else. He's good looking. He's wealthy. He has status. He has all of this stuff at his disposal. Right? I mean, anytime that I would play basketball, I would always look for the tallest guy and like kind of cower, like, oh no, they must be good. And then that guy was like a chump that I could jump over, you know. But that's the thing, is like people would look at Saul and he's bigger than everybody else. He's an opposing figure. He's got status, he's got class, he's got wealth, he's got all this stuff going for him. And because of that, you look at his story several times over, you see him kind of falling back on that instead of leading the people closer to God. His heart was just empty of the things of God. Because partial obedience was good enough. But here's the thing. If you contrast that with the heart of our king, man, the Bible never really gives a physical description of Jesus other than like Isaiah 53 too. And what it says there, it says he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. This tells us that Jesus was ordinary. He was an ordinary guy. He didn't stand out. He wasn't like walking around in white robes and glowing and had perfect product in his hair. And he didn't stand out like that. Saul, head taller than everybody else, big guy, strong guy, leader, military commander. People knew him. They could see him from a mile away. Right? Kind of like me at preschool. Jesus, ordinary guy. Nothing about him physically drew people to him. And that's what's awesome, because he didn't have an image to fall back on like Saul. And he didn't rely on his position. If you look at these scriptures, let me write these down. These are incredible. John 6, 38, this is the words of Jesus. He says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And when you contrast that with the heart of Saul, this is polar opposite where Saul was self-seeking and looked to serve himself and build his own little kingdom. I mean, did you even catch that? Like, um, where is that? At the end of, of 1 Samuel 13, I think it's in uh, verse 15. Yeah, look at verse 15. Zach, can you read verse 15 out loud? Then Samuel left the old hall and went up to give the and Saul not the men who were with him for about six years. Okay, so you check that. After all this happens, Samuel leaves and goes back to this place to worship. And what does Saul do? He counts the people around him. He wants to know what his status is, even now. His heart is about himself, but Jesus says, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the driving force behind Jesus' ministry in life, is that he's doing God's will. In John 4.34, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That is what he feasts on. That is what sustains him. That is what upholds him. That is what gives him strength. His humble submission to the will of God and finding the joy that there is in saying yes to what God has for you. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is the polar opposite of King Saul, who had no heart for God. But we look at our King Jesus, whose heart is only angled towards pleasing the Father. So what do we do with that? A couple more verses to look up. 1 John 2, 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So if you say you love Jesus, if you say you have a relationship with Christ, your life should look like his and not like Saul's. Saul fell back on his own resources, his own position, his own influence, and he was okay with partial obedience, which is really just disobedience made to look acceptable. But Jesus, if we are followers of Jesus, and we are to walk in the same way in which he walked, that means we are humble. We will stoop. We will sacrifice. We will be with instead of isolate. Look at the life of Jesus. Look at your own life. How do the two match up? 
2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the old and new has come. Who you are, who you used to be, all of that doesn't matter because of Christ. There is newness, and there is freedom, and there is joy, and there is relief, and there is release in an identity with Christ. There's no more shame, there's no more head hanging, there's no more I wish, or I hope, or I'll never. There's no more of that. Because the old has passed away and the new has come. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Our call is to be transformed, not to transform our circumstances and get a little antsy. Jesus is our good king who has the right heart of humility and of service and of sacrifice and of obedience. Saul had no heart for God. We see that clearly in the story and more so as he descends into madness later on in the book. So to live transformed lives means that we have a choice to make. Before you today are two kings, and I know which one I would rather be like. What about you?